Good morning. Our scripture this morning is from Ezekiel, the 37th chapter, the first 14 verses. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you, and make flesh come upon you, and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and the tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breathe from the fork winds and breathe into these slain so that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. May the Lord add rich blessing to the reading of those words from the Old Testament this morning. Let me ask you a question. What would be your dream job? Can you imagine having a job working for the Queen of England? On February of 2018, Britain's royal family posted a job ad for a digital communications officer to manage the social media account for Queen Elizabeth. For 30,000 pounds per year, or about $38,000 US, the digital communications officer will post articles, videos, and photos about the Queen's state visits and royal business, and they'll put them on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. The Queen has a worldwide following on social media, and she has a very certain image to uphold. It would be a huge responsibility to be the spokesperson for the Queen, or for any uh, public figure for that matter. What qualifications would get you the job? What would you have to have on your resume to get this job? Well, in addition to social media experience, and a college degree, the royal job said that the queen was looking for someone innovative with a creative flair that would do their job as part of a, a fast paced and dynamic team. Now, thinking of the scripture that I read this morning, do you think that God chose Ezekiel to be his prophet to the nation of Israel because he was innovative and had a creative flair? I doubt it. See, God seems to choose his servants based on their obedience, not their skill set. And we know Ezekiel wasn't part of a fast-paced and dynamic team. You see, the job of prophet, which is what Ezekiel was, probably was the loneliest job on earth. The Harvard Business Review surveyed 1,600 workers to measure the levels of loneliness on the job. And people who worked in 
law, engineering, and science reported the highest levels of loneliness in their jobs. But I bet the Harvard Business Review did not include profits in their survey because it has to be the number one loneliest job in history. And it's a dangerous job too. In fact, if you want to test this theory of how dangerous the job of profit is, just try finishing every sentence you say with the words, in accordance with prophecy, and see how quickly people would like to punch you in the head. Because you see, no one wants to hear the hard truths anymore. No one wants to be told that they are sinful and they're rebellious and they are on the wrong side of God's will. There's an old story about Moishi. Now, Moishi was a medieval Jewish uh, astrologer who prophesied that the king's favorite horse would die soon. Sure enough, the horse died a short time later. The king got angry with Moishi, certain that his prophecy had brought about the horse's demise. And so he summoned Moishi to the throne room and he commanded him, he said, prophet, tell me when you will die. Well, Moishi realized that the king was planning to kill him immediately, no matter what his answer was or whatever answer he gave. So he had to answer very carefully. He said, I do not know when I will die. I only know that whenever I die, the king will die three days later. Guess what? Moishi lived a long time. You see, prophets have just one job, just, just one job, that's all they have, and that is to speak for God. And sometimes God has some very uncomfortable things to say to us. When a person is freezing to death, for instance, he feels a pleasant numbness that he doesn't want to end. It just almost feels good. He just goes to sleep and he is freezing to death. But when heat is applied and the blood begins rushing into the infected area, pain immediately occurs. Even though it hurts, the pain is indicative of rescue and cure. God sends a prophet to people who are cold in their relationship to God, spiritually freezing to death. Even though they want to stay that way, the prophet turns up the heat, you see, and they get angry at him when he is actually working to make them better. So instead of viewing prophets as killjoys, what if we viewed them as symbols of hope? Because if God had given up on his people, he wouldn't have sent a prophet. He wouldn't have sent anybody. If God sends a prophet, that means there is still hope. Ezekiel faced a very difficult task because he was called to prophesy to the Jewish people at one of the lowest points in their history. The small nation of Israel had been under siege and was finally conquered by the mighty army of Babylonia. Jerusalem laid in ruins. The temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. Ezekiel, along with thousands of other Jews, was forced into exile to the capital city of Babylon, which was in modern day Iraq. Can you imagine being a refugee living in poverty in a strange land? Your center of worship has been destroyed. Your community has been scattered. Where is your family? You don't know where your family's at. You can't find your neighbors. How do you rebuild your life when everything has been taken away from you? Their life was in their worship, in their identity as God's chosen people. Did this mean that God had forsaken them, that his covenant was not, no longer with them, with the land of Israel? Had the people lost their identity as the people of the one true God? God sent Ezekiel to these desperate and broken people to answer that very question. In 1665, the bubonic plague swept through the city of London. People who had the means to escape the city did so. Others were piled up in open pits because there wasn't enough ground or grave diggers to give proper burial to the dead. 
Men roamed the streets prophesying uh, of the prophet of the destruction of the city. One prophet wandered around naked through the streets chanting, Oh, the great and dreadful God. Oh, the great and dreadful God. Do you suppose that's what Ezekiel wanted to say when he stood there in the valley of dry bones and looking around? Did he want to say, Oh, the great and dreadful God? Maybe so, because it was a terrible time in the life of Israel. See, Jews insisted on a proper burial for their dead as a way of honoring them. So an unburied body was a sign of shame and disgrace. This was a time of fear, heartbreak, and shame on Israel. And then God asked Ezekiel the strangest question. Now God asked Ezekiel this question. He said, son of man, can these bones live? Why even ask the question at this point? Why does God try to interject hope in our most hopeless times? When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden and hid themselves from God, God killed an animal and fashioned clothes for them so that they could cover their shame. When Abram and Sarah were reached their golden years without having any children, God promised them a son and then delivered to them Isaac. When Esther was a teenage bride in a foreign kingdom, God gave her the courage to stand up to a heartless king and to save her people. In hopeless situations, God keeps giving his people hope. So, where is the hope in the Valley of Dry Bones? We find our hope in this. God always keeps his promises. If God tells you that things are going to get all right or be better, trust him because God always keeps his promises. Ezekiel was confronted with a challenging situation at this point. These weren't people with a future. These were dry bones. And God is calling Ezekiel to prophesy to them. Now, I want to tell you, as a pastor who has been called to preach God's word, I can tell you it's very hard, it's hard enough to prophesy or to preach to living people. You may find it hard to believe, but there are some hard-headed people who come to church almost every Sunday who don't want to listen to the word of God. They don't want to listen to anything that the Lord has to say. So, why prophesy to dry bones? Well, you see, the power wasn't in Ezekiel's prophecy. The power was in Ezekiel's obedience. The power was in the promises of God. So Ezekiel starts to prophesy to the dry bones. And God begins to speak through him. He said, I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. And at the sound of God's promises, these dry bones rose up from the valley floor and assembled themselves into skeletons. And the muscles and tendons and sinews and flesh covered their bones and they became bodies again. And God called the winds from the four corners of the earth to breathe life into these bodies. And the, those bodies came to life and stood on their feet. And they assembled themselves into a vast army. Now, it didn't assemble themselves into a crowd or a mob, but an army. An army has a purpose. An army has allegiance. An army has unity and power and a goal and a mission. <clears throat> and God explains to Ezekiel that those valley of dry bones represents the nation of Israel. They were dead, hopeless, and cut off from the power of God, but they will not remain that way, no matter how circumstances look now, no matter what the history books say, no matter what the politicians say, or the pundits, or the newscasters. Listen 
to what God says. He said, my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. God will keep his promises to them and to us as well. But when did God first make those promises to the nation of Israel? Way back in Genesis, the 12th chapter, when God told an old childless man named Abram to leave his country and his people and go to the land that the Lord would show him. And this was God's promise that first gave life to the nation of Israel. He said, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless you and who, those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all people on earth will be blessed through you. So how would that happen? When God sent his son Jesus through the lineage of Abraham and the nation of Israel to make a new covenant in his blood, that would offer salvation and new life to all people on earth. We read that in Luke, the 22nd chapter. That's why you and I are here today, or that's why you are tuned in today. We are included in God's promises also. Each and every one of us are included. On September the 4th, 2012, Alex Sheen's father died. Now, most people would describe Alex's father as average man, but Alex describes him as a man of his word. At his father's funeral, Alex passed around small cards to everyone in attendance. He called them promise cards, and at the bottom of each card were the words printed, because I said I would. His father lived by those words. He always kept his promises, and in honor of his father, Alex challenged those in attendance at the funeral to write on the card a promise and then do their very best to keep that promise. The people at Mr. Sheen's funeral were very inspired by Alex's promise cards that they began printing more and more and asking for more and more. Today, Alex Sheen runs a nonprofit called Character Education Programming and he does it in schools, colleges, and prisons. He teaches about integrity and honor and character, and yes, keeping your promises. And this organization has sent more than 11 million promise cards to people over 150 countries. Now I'd like to tell you a story about a young woman named Elizabeth, 26 years old. She lives in the United Kingdom. And Elizabeth works at an assisted living facility. And she eats lunch every day with a particular old lady who has dementia. And every day at the end of their lunch, the woman would become very afraid that Elizabeth would not come back to see her the next day. Her dementia made her forget how very faithful Elizabeth was to her. So Elizabeth took a promise card and wrote on it, I promise I will come and have lunch with you tomorrow. At the end of the card, there were the words, because I said I would. Next day, when Elizabeth showed up for her lunch, she found her friend waiting there, clutching that card in her hand. And she looked at Elizabeth and she said, you remembered. God will never forget his promises. God will never forget his people. Across every page in the Bible, God writes his promises and signs them with these words, because I said I would. Listen to the promises God made through Ezekiel. To his people who were dead and hopeless and cut off, he will give you life and new hope. He will bring them back to their home again and put his spirit within them. 
He will turn death into life. He will turn a valley of dry bones into an army of God. How do we know this? Because he said he would. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. Folks, as we move through and live through these very troubling and bad days that we find ourselves in with this virus, we have to remember that God is not done keeping his promises to his people. God is faithful and God plans are eternal. And we as God's people can base our lives and our hope on the promises of God. Amen.